Um, okay, so we're starting our session on whether fish feel pain. Uh, we have a very balanced group here. We have Victoria Braithwaite, who is in favor of um, uh, the idea that fish have pain. Um, uh, Stuart Derbyshire, who's uh, uh, against, and Colin Allen is somewhere in the middle. I'm sure we're all um, uh, rooting for the anti-pain forces so we can have a clear conscience at dinner. <laughs> Um, so, our, <laughs> our, our first speaker, Victoria Braithwaite, has discovered, has written a book on fish, a controversial book on fish, and uh, she's discovered pain fibers in fish, which, uh, pain fibers which, when they are in creatures that uncontroversially feel pain, are pain fibers. Um, and, uh, take away, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? Great. Thank you. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Glad someone has a sense of humor. Okay. So, um, I want to uh, show you a quick video to begin with. And I No? Louder. Louder. I'm going to, sh there we go. I'm going to show you a video to begin with, and I'm going to leave it up to you to decide what this fish is actually experiencing. So this is, it's trying to eat a spiny prey. It has one go at this, and it never goes back to that uh, spiny prey, even though it hasn't fed for over 24 hours. Other fish which are eating smoothback prey eat these prey very quickly without uh, any hesitation. Um, so some, I'll play it once more, because if you blink, you, you miss it. So here it goes. It goes in. It makes an attempt. Something didn't sit right. Something didn't work out there, and so it doesn't eat it. Great for the invertebrate, which is why it has the spines that it does. But did the fish actually feel any pain associated with that? So what we're asking here is, does it hurt? Did that experience hurt the fish? And I've put this picture up here to um, um, uh, introduce this idea that this is something that we've been talking about, even in ourselves, as not being quite sure when we experienced the feeling of hurt. This was a review article from Nature in 2006. Um, and uh, even back then there were debates and discussions about when it was appropriate to be providing analgesia for preterm babies or, or um, uh, very early um, uh, newborns. Um, and there was a, a dis uh, different opinions about whether um, they were too young at this stage of their development to actually experience pain or not. The whole debate and the ideas have moved on, but I'm, and I'm not going to dwell on that just now because I want to focus on animals and particularly um, fish. But again, just to put up here, these dates are not that old. So back in the 1980s, animal researchers uh, here in New York City didn't consider post-surgery pain relief important for um, the animals that were being used in experiments. By the year 2000, that opinion had changed. But even then, we, you know, we were still struggling to try and find the, quiet, the, the, the most appropriate kinds of analgesia to use for these animals. So what do we mean by pain? What I want to do is begin by actually dissecting it a little bit and suggesting to you that it isn't one thing. We always talk about pain, and, and, and in fact, we often add suffering onto that as though that's a natural given. It doesn't have to be. I want to just focus on the pain part just now. And I'm going to suggest that actually it's two things, and it's important for us to make this distinction between these two processes. So the first part is the sensory detection. Let me move this so I can see my own slides. There we go. The sensory detection of damage, and we call this nociception. Animals that protect themselves through this uh, uh, nociceptive process are going to be more likely to survive and reproduce. That's very adaptive, right? It's the definition of adapt adaptiveness. So we would expect it to be very widespread as a process throughout the animal kingdom. It would be slightly strange if animals couldn't protect themselves when something damaging did occur. But the second part of pain is that it's also a subjective um, experience, a negative valenced feeling that only the individual actually truly experiences. So, the first part, the, is, uh, the nociceptive part is where receptors in the skin, we call these nociceptors, are detecting damage and then relaying information, triggering responses. And that can op uh, operate in many cases within the vertebrates at the level of the spinal cord. It doesn't actually need to travel up to the brain in order to produce appropriate protective responses. The second part, the hurt, the negative emotional experience, is processed by the brain. And that's the bit that I think involves the ouch and the hurt. And so I'm going to be making a distinction between these two processes. So what about fish? 
Do fish actually do these two processes? And how can we figure, uh, figure this out? So it turns out that if you have a look um, and you uh, um, look at the neurophysiology of the fish, they do have nociceptors and they work when you treat them with something, uh, an, a noxious stimulus of some kind. We focused on the trout, on the face of the trout. This was some of the initial work we did back in 2003. And the little dots that you see on the face here are where we identified these spe um, specialized pain receptors. So uh, um, their sole purpose on the face and their function is to actually detect when damage is occurring. If you go into the nerves and you have a look at what's in there, the pain fibers that Ned was just talking about are also there. And they are extremely similar to the kinds of nerve fibers that are in you, that we find in birds. So mammals and birds and fish share these two kinds of pain fiber. And they, again, they transmit information solely about this uh, uh, noxious damage that is occurring. So we call these uh, different fiber types a, um, a delta fibers and C fibers. The, the names don't actually matter. The fact that they're there is the important part. Now, there are some differences. There are actually fewer C fibers in fish than we find uh, in terrestrial vertebrates. Um, we're not quite sure why that is. It might be something to do with the uh, aquatic environment and the fact that, they're very, um, that they are endothermic, they're cold-blooded. Um, but so, so it's not completely the same, and it's, uh, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, we're still trying to understand why these differences are there. But the bottom line is, no susceptors in the same way that we would detect them in us are there in fish. So what happens when we actually treat the fish with something noxious? So we can do this by, uh, in a number of ways. We've, we've actually used bee venom but as well as weak acetic acid. And you can put a small amount of this into the snout of the fish and then compare the behavior and the responses of the fish um, with control fish that also are given a small injection of saline, something inert. So uh, when you do this, you get a number of responses. So the noxious stimulation generates a long-term loss of appetite. Um, uh, their um, gill beat rate goes rapidly in the same way that uh, when you experience something painful, quite often you start to breathe a little bit more rapidly. We get very similar kinds of response in the fish. The fish also, as they are recovering from uh, the uh, noxious stimulus, end up rocking on their front two pectoral fins on the gravel at the bottom. And they also rub the snout area when they're treated with the acetic acid. They don't do this response when they've got the bee venom. Um, but the, the, the uh, two noxious stimuli we're using here are actually generating slightly different kinds of uh, uh, noxious stimulation. One is swelling, the other is an itching. This is an itching, the, the acetic acid one. So they rub their snout, and you can see that in, in terms of the, the, the frequency with which we're seeing that rocking and rubbing there. Okay. So, uh, sorry, just go back here. So the nociceptors are there, and when you stimulate them, we see nociceptive-like responses to these behaviors, and, and we're also seeing some other cascading kinds of, of response here. So let's take a step back and say, okay, so where in the animal kingdom then do we see nociception? Well, where it's been looked for, it's there. And uh, you can see uh, the uh, areas that I circle here. You've seen lots of uh, these trees already this afternoon. This is a slightly different one. But the point is, I'm trying to illustrate, it is a very widespread phenomenon. Um, where it hasn't been looked for in the middle here, I think we'd find it if we actually looked. Um, uh, just because it is such an important uh, process to be able to protect the animal. So, so that's nociception, and, and, uh, and I, I ho hope to have convinced you that, that fish can certainly do that, and in fact, much of the animal kingdom can do it. But what about this second part? What about the subjective part, the, um, um, uh, the feeling of the hurt? So this felt component of pain is very closely associated with nociception, but it turns out you can actually dissociate it. For a long time, it was thought that they were um, uh, very uh, cl so closely aligned that they didn't dissociate. But there's now evidence that shows that they can. And we know this for two reasons. The first is there are rare cases, um, uh, medical cases, uh, such as pain asymbolia, where there is um, uh, damage to the either anterior, in anterior cingulate cortex or the insula, and in these patients, when they don't have those brain regions functioning, they can describe to you that they're aware that something is, uh, um, uh, th that they're aware of, a, um, of an injury, but they don't describe it as unpleasant. So that hurt part and the negative valenced part is now missing from this bit. So something associated with at least these two regions seems to be playing some kind of role. Um, and as you can see, they can do the nociceptive part in terms of the sensory detection that the damage has occurred, but they're not doing that second part. The other bit of evidence that we have is when we actually ask for people to report what happens when you provide pain relief using an opiate like morphine. So when you treat patients who have a very um, uh, a bad injury with morphine, 
and then ask them to report on how they're feeling, they will say, well, I'm aware that it's there, I'm aware that the damage is there, but it's no longer bothering me. So again, the unpleasantness of the pain has somehow been dissociated from the actual detection of the pain. So I want to use this idea that we can actually separate these things to justify why I think talking about uh, pain and nociception is important, but also to make the point that when we're talking about pain, we're in a way almost always thinking about this second part and the hurt part. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that we have got these two processes that are occurring. So what about in fish? Well, if we, uh, um, can we actually see any evidence of this association? Well, one of the things we can do is we can do the same experiment that I've just described to you, of, of putting a, a noxious stimulus, stimulus into the snout of the fish, and then we can have a look at how that, those responses might change when we provide morphine. And when you do provide morphine, the rocking and the rubbing decreases. Does that mean that we've actually been able to dissociate the pain here and the fish are no longer bothered by their pain? Possibly, but there are also lots of alternative explanations to this, not least of which is that one of the things that morphine uh, does in addition to um, potentially dissociating or to d dissociating nociception from, uh, from the hurt um, is that it depresses a lot of behavior. So it could just be the depression in behavior or the decreasing of behavior here that we're actually measuring. So in and of itself, this is interesting, but it's not clear enough result. So we went on to try to address this in a slightly different way. And we used the logic here of now trying to understand what uh, a fish that was actually experiencing or an animal that is experiencing something that is hurting them may have, um, uh, m uh, may have trouble doing. And one of those things is attention. So being able to pay attention to and focus on things that are in the environment. So um, uh, we've heard a little bit this morning already about uh, attentional mechanisms and so forth and potential connections there with consciousness. I'm going to uh, follow this, a similar line of logic here and say, okay, so if a fish is, is feeling its pain, is it distracted? How do you test that? Very simply, you can take a tank with a fish in it, you can put an object, a novel object, into the tank, and the fish, when they're under normal circumstances, will show very strong avoidance of that novel object to begin with until they've recognized that it's not harmful. So the initial reaction is to move away and to stay away. So it's an active movement away from that object. So we tested fish, both with and without, with the saline again, and then with the acetic acid, and we looked at their response to this novel object. And when we did that, we saw quite big difference here in terms of uh, the responses of the two groups. The group given the acetic acid injection the, um, uh, actually moved closer towards the novel object rather than trying to avoid it. So um, there seems to be clear, clearly here the um, uh, effect of the acetic acid treatment <coughs> is doing something that's different to the control. Now, if that is truly a result of the fish not being able to concentrate or to uh, pay attention to this novel object in the environment, um, we ought to be able to reverse this effect with the morphine. So if we repeat this experiment now and provide the morphine, what do we actually see? So that's what we did, and these are the results. So now, when you provide the fish with morphine, <coughs> you now have a similar response between both the control and the acetic acid group. And the important bit about this particular experiment is that the fish are actively having to move away. So if they were to, s to, uh, to stay still and to stay put, we wouldn't be getting this reaction. So we're needing the fish to move themselves away. And, they, and th so the, the uh, noxious stimulation and the morphine are allowing the fish to actually actively do that. So it does seem then that this uh, uh, noxious stimulation in the fish is producing something that is impairing their ability to, to focus and concentrate on that novel object that's in the environment. Okay, so, now you're gonna, I'm pr I'm, I don't know what Stuart Derbyshire is going to say in the next part, we'll find out, but I do know that he doesn't really believe these experiments, okay? <laughs> so you're gonna, you're gonna get his interpretation of why these experiments are not convincing. Um, we've had a number of uh, um, um, interesting and lively debates about whether the kinds of work that we have shown here do demonstrate pain or not. And some time ago, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether fish have the relevant bits of the brain and so forth. But I think just based on the, the, this morning's conversation about the invertebrate brains that we were looking at and what those brains were actually um, capable of doing, really emphasizes this point that it's a bit misleading often to look at what, the, uh, what bits of the brain are doing what and try to make inferences from that. So we, we looked at that for some time and then I moved away from this to try and take a slightly different al alternative route to try and understand what may or may not be going on in the fish. 
And what we began to do was to try and understand what it is that having um, awareness or feelings might actually do for the fish. So rather than looking at pain per se, we started to look at, well, what does it mean for a fish to actually be aware? And what does it mean for a fish to actually feel something? So for this, and again, um, just as Andrew, Andrew Barron mentioned this morning, his, his coming to the psychology, that's very much what I did. And uh, I am going to tell you a little bit of work now that I've done with Paula Drogi, who's also at Penn State with me. And Paula has um, uh, an idea that for uh, her definition of, of, of consciousness is that temporal representation provides a critical link between the internal experiences and behavior and underpins an animal's ability to behave in flexible ways. So when she told me this, I thought, hmm, that's interesting, because maybe we could use this idea of the behavioral flexibility to look at whether an animal is actually truly aware of its current circumstances. So was that fish, when we put the object into the tank, aware of the environment that it was in, and it was um, uh, making decisions about what to do next based on that awareness and understanding? So how can you address this? How can you look at this? Well, Paula and I have uh, put together a framework um, of uh, these four examples here, which if you can demonstrate these, we believe that it is showing this um, temporal capacity and therefore an, a, a, a state of awareness is possible. So here we're suggesting that explicit representation of absent, absent objects, differential response to the environment under different conditions, adaptation to novel situations, and manipulation of the environment to accomplish certain goals could um, uh, be a useful way to, to approach this. More recently, I've been working with uh, a colleague, Dan Weary, at UBC, and he, Paula, and I um, have uh, um, uh, pulled together some ideas to think about other ways in which we could look for behavioral evidence of felt emotion. And that's in a paper that just came out a little bit earlier this year. I'm not going to have very much time to talk about that, if any, because I want to show you some videos at the end. Um, but I'll just flag you to that paper for thinking about um, this is another way for us to actually try and understand um, the emotional lives of, of, of the fish, if you will. So for the, um, uh, for, for the approach with Paula uh, Drogi, we've come up with four examples that we believe in fish show these four different criteria. I'm going to talk a little bit more or show you some data for the one in red, but just briefly, the explicit representation of objects. This little fella on the right here is a frilfin goby. They live in tidal pools, and they can very accurately jump from one pool to another. They take one high tide to, to swim around, learn the depressions in the topography, and then they can use that experience of high tide that when the tide goes out and they're in their little pool and a bird comes along and tries to pick them off, they will jump from one pool to the next pool to the next pool, never landing on dry rock, always knowing exactly which jump and which direction to actually leap in. Um, to do that, they need some kind of understanding and representation of the depressions that are around them. And so we're suggesting here that they have this um, ability to uh, uh, create a mental representation. The differential response to uh, the environment, I'm going to come back and tell you a little bit about cleaner fish. Fish can do transitive inference. And this is important because it allows them to adapt their behavior and change their behavior to um, uh, novel situations. And you can look at this in terms of uh, fighting fish and the fights that they do with each other. These fights can get extremely aggressive, and the fish will spend a lot of time watching each other to figure out how strong a fighter each individual is. And they use these to create rankings and an understanding of who's dominant to who and where you might fit into the picture. And so uh, uh, using a very clever technique, um, uh, Russ Fernald uh, at Stanford University showed that male cichlids will remember the relative fighting ability of individuals that he sees doing these fights. They're staged fights, they're put together, and so this is an artificial ranking is put there. And then they can tell the difference between A and E, no problem, but they've only ever seen A win and E lose. The really interesting distinction is when they see B and D, because those fish have equally won and lost, but yet when you put those two together, the fish that's uh, making the decision will um, indicate that B is the dominant fish and D is the subordinate fish. Um, so it appears to be a transit inf inference of capacities here. Manipulation of the environment, I'm gonna show you a little clip and video at that at the end if I can. Um, it can be going whilst the questions are going. Um, tusk fish will actually use a hard rocky outcrop on the uh, coral reef to bash a shell against it as an anvil. Um, so that they can actually crack the shell open. And as I say, I'll show you that in just a sec. So what is it that the, the cleaner fish are doing? Cleaner fish are a really interesting interaction. They have client fish, cleaner fish have stations, or different species do slightly different things, but the ones I'm talking about have stations where the client fish will come in. The client fish are coming in to be de -stripped, or stripped, if you like, of their ectoparasites. And the cleaner fish have to, um, uh, the, the, the clients have a choice 
of where they go. So cleaner fish have to put on a sufficiently good service that the clients will come in and that they'll return. Okay? So the cleaner fish want to f gain favour. They can do this by massaging the fish. They have pectoral fin motions that they'll do up and down the side of the fish, the client fish. Um, but they, um, they have a problem, which is they don't really like the ectoparasites. They're not particularly nutritious. What they want out of this interaction is to every now and again be able to take a bite from the fish because that has mucus and uh, uh, scales and, and, and protein. Okay. Um, so I'm running out of time here. The point is they cheat. Okay, and they have to watch how much they're cheating because if they cheat too often, they lose the relationship with the client. So they will police one another in the pair to make sure that within, within each other that they're not che uh, cheating too much. And uh, they will also uh, um, watch how the client is behaving. And the other fish can see whether the, the cheating has gone on or not because they, uh, f the client fish will judder whenever a bite has been taken out of it. So in these two experiments here, what you can see is that in this top one, there's an invisible bystander in the middle here, so uh, he is busy watching what's going on in terms of the cleaning on either side. And this bystander then gets a choice about where do you want to go and be cleaned, and he chooses to go to the uh, clients where there's been much less jolting. If there's been too much jolting, then those, the, uh, those cleaner fish pairs are not uh, chosen. The more interesting one here is when the cleaner fish is aware that there's a bystander actually watching, so somebody in the distance is actually watching the interactions going on, he cheats less. So he actually cooperates more when he's being watched. So um, I haven't, as I say, I haven't time to go through that, but the example, yep, time is up. I'm just going to finish it here with these two slides, and I'm going to get them going. The top one here I haven't talked about. The bottom one I'll get going. This is the, the um, tusk fish that's actually digging up a shell and is now going to take it off down the reef to go and smash it against the um, anvil. This one up here is cooperative hunting between two different species. A grouper that you can see that can outswim its prey. It's going to dash off in a second. But every now and again, the prey fish will disappear into the coral reef. When it can't get the prey fish out, it goes and recruits a moray eel. And together, they go off down the reef. The grouper will tell the um, uh, eel where um, it needs to go. So it's pointing here with its snout, where it last saw the prey fish go in. The eel uses this as a signal to figure out that that's where in the reef the, the prey fish is cornered. Half the time, the eel will corner the prey fish and get to eat it. The other half of the time, the fish dashes out of the reef and the grouper ambushes it. So they share the spoils in this way. They communicate with each other with very vigorous uh, head shakes of the grouper saying t to the eel outside its uh, um, uh, cave, I want, I want you to come and help me hunt, I want to hunt. Some very recent work by a Red Wambashiri who does this work um, at Neuchâtel in Switzerland has even shown that uh, the grouper are very discerning about which eels they will do this with and they s selectively will choose more cooperative eels. So again, they're making decisions about which eels are cooperative or not. Now, we've come a long way from pain, but what I'm trying to do is to suggest that we can use the behaviors and the kinds of approach that we've done here to come at pain or the hurt from pain in a different direction and ask questions about whether the fish have capa uh, capacity for feelings. And I have to finish there. Thank you. Hi, um, so it seems to me that your idea of pain is it's kind of like an evolutionary adaptation that the fish are able to use, they're flexible and they can respond with it. Um, from that, I, at the start of your talk you mentioned that, um, I think it's in vertebrates that it occurs, that pain can be detected and you can respond to it without it reaching the brain. Um, so on this, um, I'm curious on your perspective on the idea that pain, the feeling of pain attached to the message of damage could occur and be understood in all brains without the feeling um, occurring at the same time? So, so, I just, so I want to pull apart a few things there. Yeah. So, so that distinction I made was between nociception and, and then the hurt. And so that nociception part can occur at the level of the spinal cord. But uh, there are messages that do go up to the brain, and it still doesn't need to hurt at that part because that can be part of the sensory detection that something is, is, is there. So I'm not, I, I think I was a little bit misleading when I said they might be completely divorced. I didn't want to suggest that. And then for, uh, for the follow-up, I think, I think all animals do the nociception. That's, well, maybe not the sponges, but 
pretty much everything else with the nervous system is doing something nociceptive like or true nociception in the way that we describe it in ourselves but I don't believe that that has to hurt in order to produce the adaptive responses and the protective mechanisms so you don't have to hurt in order to do withdrawal and and protect yourself um, I think the hurt helps and it's clearly got added value because it's there but it's not essential for those invertebrates all of the, all of those invertebrates I'm on your side, so this is a, not a hostile question. <laughs> I'm on your side and the fish's side. But you are making a distinction that's a little bit uh, problematic. Okay. Nociception, you can't s simply call nociception pain nope. that's not felt. It's damage detection that's not felt. Right. And when you talk about the... Uh, uh, the uh, human ex example where you give medication so that uh, the, the stimulation is still felt, yes. but it's not hurting, that's pain. Well, what's missing is pain, but there's still sentience there. And this is a conference on sentience. You're, you're talking about the pain, particular form of sentience, which is pain, and it's only present when it's felt. If it's not felt, it's, it's not, not pain. pain. I agree. Okay, so I do agree with that, and I apologize for being sloppy with my... No, no apologies. It's all for the fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, and I want to say thank you. Um, I was wondering about the, a distinction you drew at the beginning. It sounded as if really all you're claiming is that fish feel something bad under certain circumstances, not that you have evidence that they feel pain as such. But other experiences sometimes feel bad. If you taste something unpleasant, it tastes bad. So is the claim that fish feel distinctively pain, which is very different from the, the experience of tasting something bad, or is it just that they experience something bad? So I'm waving my hand at this point and suggesting that if they have feeling and a capacity for, for feeling something bad, um, uh, whether it's, it's, it's taste or it's, it's something noxious, um, uh, then, then it is feeling it. Um, but I also think it's important, uh, and again, we got a little bit at this, this this morning, and I think it may come out a little bit later on. What we're trying to make in this 2017 paper is, is that there are distinctions between feelings that are felt and feelings that are um, uh, not felt. So I think there are both of those. Unfelt feelings. Say again? Unfelt feelings. Unfelt feelings. Feelings that you're not feeling. Feelings that you're not feeling. Emotional, emotional responses that are... Um, so, okay, and this, I know, okay, this happens a lot. <laughs> I'm at a, a philosophy conference, and often when Paula and I have conversations like this, we go... And then we come like this. Um, uh, I, again, all right, I'm not... So I, I'm not talking about a sensory detection at this point. I'm talking about an emotional response. So you can have felt emotional... Oh, oh can, I, can I avoid that word? You can have emotional responses that you're aware of and emotional responses that you are not aware of. And those subtly change your behaviour in different ways. And I think things that uh, you are emotionally aware of are attracting your attention. They are garnering um, your uh, brain power, whatever it is, to be able to focus and pay attention to the thing that matters right now. And that's why I think we have these attentional mechanisms and felt emotions that actually allow us to um, focus our attention where we need it, when we need it. I hope I'm. Um, yeah, if I, I'm sorry. It, it's good that you're trying to keep me sorted with my terminology. I'm a biologist. I am a biologist <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> yeah, I should say it's like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Now. <laughs> Victoria, I'm a biologist. Um, well, thank you. Uh, you began your talk by distinguishing between mere nociception from the kind of things that humans have in the normal case, the felt awareness of the, the negative valence of pain, as you put it. And then some of the considerations you raised later made me wonder if there are actually even three things that we can disambiguate and ask whether fish feel any of those. The, the nociception on one hand, the felt pain with a negative valence on the other hand, and then the kind of m mere awareness without the negative valence that you mentioned certain human patients have when they have certain kinds of brain damage. And it seems like all three of those are actually different. And you could have nociception with no awareness whatsoever than maybe awareness of tissue damage. That sounds like a kind of consciousness, but with no negative valence and then the fully negative valence thing. And we could ask whether fish have any of those three things, if, even if they do have nociception, maybe have the second, not the third, and so on. Does that seem right? Yes. 
You could ask those things, and I, haven't, I have not addressed that in my approach of looking at the, the um, uh, flexibility in the behaviour and trying to get at um, um, awareness of emotion. Um, could get at some of that, but, it's not, uh, but that's not what I've been focusing on. But I think you, you've, uh, what you're describing is possible. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, so I know studies have been done, I believe, with chickens where they use preference testing t and they, to see whether fish that have been injured will show shifts in food preference for, and they'll go to, f to less preferred with analgesics. Have you tried that? Somebody did that with fish, I thought. Was, so sure. it has been done. Thank you. Um, the studies in the gray literature, it wasn't, um, it wasn't controlled as well as it might have been. Um, uh, but what it, what it was, uh, I, I want to be a little bit, so I don't think that the appropriate study's been done, looking at analgesia, and, and the, but it could be done, and it should be done. Yep. So Stuart is an expert on um, uh, fetal pain um, and uh, has argued that uh, that fetuses do not feel pain. Um, he also studies... Um, uh, oh, sorry. Stuart's an expert on fetal pain and has argued that uh, fetuses don't feel pain. Um, he's also investigated ways that he can um, cause pain in people without noxious stimuli or injury. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'll tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> thanks for that uh, introduction. And thanks so much for the invitation to this conference. It's always a pleasure to come to New York City. Um, but I'm going to make myself very un unpopular in this audience. I'm going to argue uh, against um, fish, pa fish pain. Okay, so first of all, though, I wonder, worth asking the question, why do we care um, about whether fish feel pain? Well, one obvious reason that we care about this is because um, of um, fishing. Um, if the fish feel pain, then being hooked by a hook is going to be quite unpleasant for the fish. That's one reason we care. We might also be concerned about general welfare issues, and I, I understand this. I, I like living on a planet with fish. I hope to continue living on a planet with fish. But these aren't the reasons why I'm particularly interested in fish pain. Um, I'm interested in it because I'm a pain guy, and it's an interesting question. It challenges what we know or what we think we know um, about pain. It forces us to ask difficult questions about pain. So let me give you an introduction to this. Here is the humble fruit fly Drosophily. We've, uh, fruit fly Drosophily larvae. We've heard a little bit about fruit flies today already, otherwise known as maggots to you and me. Um, and they're not particularly interesting creatures, but they do do one interesting thing, which is that if you light a flame next to them, they will bend and roll away from that flame. And this um, response to the flame is based on intact, almost free nerve endings in the skin um, of um, the maggot. And what I do with most audiences at this point, and I'll do it with you too, is I ask, well, would you call this response a pain response? And if so, um, why? That's a very dangerous question to ask in this room. Let me tell you that most audiences ask this, this question, it's an obvious no. They all go, no, this would not feel pain. You guys are very sophisticated. I have lots of arguments about this. I know that some of you are going to say yes. But bear with me. Let's just take it as a bit of a no um, for this particular question. So there we've got a starting point. Here we have a creature that's very clearly alive, has a response to noxious events, but does not um, experience pain. And then you've got you. Um, you're also very much alive, you respond to noxious events, and you very clearly do feel pain. So there's the interesting question. Where on the spectrum of life um, does pain um, appear? And fish are interesting because maybe it's them. Um, fish are more than maggots, fish do more than maggots. And Victoria's already been through this, so I don't need to spend much time on this. She's already told you fish have nociceptors, and yes, they do. And if you tip acid on the chemical nociceptors, um, they will respond um, vigorously. If you go further into the nervous system, you'll see responses um, in the spinal cord and in the cerebellum and in the higher regions of the fish brain that preferentially respond to um, noxious events. And if you look at what fish do during these noxious events, they change their behavior. They rock, they rub the affected area, they more readily approach um, objects in their environments, they lose their neophobia. All that Victoria's already told you. And as it happens, I, I will concede all of this. I think all of this is true. 
I do think there's still an issue to be had about the um, nervous system of fish. So if you look at the brain of a fish, that's shown here schematically, this is your brain shown schematically, the brain stem is massive in the fish. It's about two-thirds of the fish brain. The cerebrum is tiny in the fish, and it's completely um, the opposite. In your brain, you have a big cerebrum, you have a relatively small um, brain stem. And if you look at just the physical size of the fish brain, it's kind of puny. And if you plot um, fish brains and human brains um, in terms of the mass of the brain versus the mass of the body, well, the fish are down here and you are up here. Now, we don't know really what the relationship between structure and function is. Neuroscience knows perhaps about that much about what the relationship between structure and function is. So I don't want to exaggerate the importance of this. But most neuroscientists do think that there's some relationship. So if the assumption that mental states reflect brain states is taken at all seriously, then it's clear the physical structure of animal brains must be taken into account in any theory about the existence of mental activity in the animal species, says Stephen Walker, and I tend to agree with that position. I think it means something, even if we don't know exactly on what it is that it means. But that's not my main thrust of my attack. My main thrust of my attack is to interrogate the term pain a little bit more closely. Um, we tend to use terms as though everybody agrees what they mean, and what they mean is just what they mean. And I think this is a problematic um, assumption, particularly problematic when it comes to pain. Probably you've not thought about pain that much, but if you have thought about pain, you've thought, well, it's that thing that happens when you have a, a painful stimulus, say a needle um, stuck in the finger, that will activate fibers that are dedicated to um, processing pain information, and that will pass information to parts of the brain that are dedicated to wringing out the experience of pain. That's probably your model um, of pain. It's known as specificity theory. It's been with us since the time of Descartes about 500 years ago. And it leads to some rather problematic um, um, issues. And the definition of pain that flows from specificity theory is somewhat tautological. Specificity defines pain in terms of the stimulus, which is painful, and the response, pain. Why is the needle painful? Because it causes pain. Why does it cause pain? Because it's painful. And round and round it goes. And where it will end, nobody knows. So it's tautological, but it also fails to account for the facts of pain. You can have pain without injury. I'm sure you've had this experience. You've cut yourself. You've noticed some blood. You've looked for with the source of the blood. You found the cut, and then um, it hurts. You can have the opposite. You can have injury without pain. Many of our most difficult clinical patients have, injury, have, have pain sorry, without any injury, fibromyalgia patients, irritable bowel syndrome, atypical facial pain. Anything that's got atypical syndrome or idiopathic in the title is that kind of pain where there's no obvious underlying cause. And then you can interrupt this pain wiring. You can cut it um, in the periphery. You can cut it in the spinal cord. You can cut it in the brain. And it doesn't seem to get rid of the pain. Often what happens is the pain will go away for a short time, but then it comes back with um, a vengeance. But I think the biggest problem with this theory is that it limits, eliminates the subject who does the feeling. It places the feeling in weird kinds of places. For example, in the stimulus. The needle becomes a pain stimulus. Whatever it is that needles do, I'm pretty sure they don't actually feel. So we need to get the feeling back into the person who's doing the feeling. And that's what the International Association of the Study of Pain have done with their definition of pain. The ISP, in order to escape the problems of specificity, define pain in quite a compli complicated way. They say it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Pain is always subjective. Each individual learns the application of the word through experiences related to injury in early life. A large number of implications flow from this um, definition of pain. First of all, it seems that pain emerges as part of the general cognitive and emotional development of the person. It's not just given directly by the biology. It also states quite clearly that pain is multidimensional. There's not such a, a pain thing, so to speak, not a pure pain sensation, but pain exists at the amalgam of sensory processes, affective processes, and cognitive processes. And then finally, it implies that pain is going to involve an awful lot um, of the brain. Let's look a little bit more closely at the first one of those. We tend to assume that we automatically perceive. We automatically see, we automatically hear, we automatically feel. These things don't have to develop, they just are. I think you think like that because you've just got so used to automatically doing those things, and you've forgotten there was a developmental process that you went through that got you there. 
There's a beautiful study um, by Ostrowski and colleagues um, which demonstrated this very nicely in patients who were born congenitally blind due to cataracts. And when those cataracts were removed, when they were adults, some surprising things um, happened. Now, if you look at any visual scene, um, you automatically see that there's a girl dancing here um, to the Scottish bagpipes in the background. But if you were to try and extract the dancing girl and the bagpipes from the hues and luminances of the, the visual scene, you'd have a hell of a hard job um, to pull that out. In our patients who had um, cataracts removed in adulthood, who'd been blind from birth, they were given very simple tasks to do as soon as they um, had the cataracts removed. They were asked how many objects, which ones in front, trace the long curve, and how many objects here. It was broadly expected that they'd be able to do these tasks simply and immediately. In fact, they couldn't. We'll just look at this one. And when asked how many objects there were here, it was somewhere between five and nine objects that the person um, identified. You probably think that's insane because you can quite clearly see that there's just one cube there. The moral of this story is that you don't just see. You don't just automatically pass your environment. You went through something that enabled you to be able to do those things. We call that something um, development. Okay, let's look at the, um, the brain itself and its involvement in pain. Um, the ISP definition it, it implies that a lot of the brain will be involved. To cut a very long story short, the ISP um, seems to be correct um, in that there's a large number of studies activating the anterior cingulate cortex, um, the primary sensory cortex, the secondary sensory cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the insula in its anterior and posterior divisions um, bilaterally. All of these different areas are involved in those different multidimensional components of pain. And we also, as uh, Ned mentioned at the beginning, we have um, demonstrated that you can generate pain with some rather strange um, stimuli. Rather than using a typical noxious, nociceptive stimulus, we can generate pain um, by excluding somebody from a cyberball game, and we activate the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, and they report an experience of pain. And we've also shown people images such as this one, people injuring themselves. Um, and about 30% of our, our subjects respond that this actually hurts their head um, when they see um, this image. And when we scan their brains looking at images like this, again, we activate the cingulate cortex, insula, thalamus, S1, S2, and so forth. And in the opposite direction, um, we also treat patients with subjective treatments. Um, so patients who have depression are four times more likely to experience chronic pain than patients that don't have depression. And patients who are in pain who worry about whether they'll ever be able to work again, whether the pain will ever get better, whether it's going to continue to deteriorate, and otherwise patients who catastrophize also experience more pain um, than do people who don't um, catastrophize. If you treat the depression, if you treat the catastrophization, their experience of pain um, goes down. We've also demonstrated that if you hypnotize people and give them suggestions of their pain going down, you can drag the pain down very low and you can push the pain up very high. And in fact, this is not important, but the hypnosis doesn't seem to be that important either. Just directly suggesting changes in pain um, will um, change um, the experience. So in summary, um, it seems that we can rule out pain in the fish because we've demonstrated the cortex is necessary for pain and fish don't have much of a cortex, um, so they cannot feel pain. It also seems that subjectivity is necessary for pain and fish don't have much of a subjectivity and so fish cannot feel pain. As I rather cruelly and rudely put it in a recent paper, fish lack the brains and the psychology um, for pain. Broadly speaking, I'm, I'm happy to leave it um, at that stage, and I'm sure Ned would be delighted because I'm only about halfway through my time, but um, I'm not going to leave it there. I'm going to problematize it just a little bit. We've, I've emphasized the subjectivity of pain. and Many pain clinicians believe that what their patients say is what they're experiencing, and the presence of injury, the presence of disease um, is not particularly important. We've completely dissociated pain from nociception in most clinical situations. But that is a bit of an odd thing to do. I mean, you'd think it was odd if you had a friend who sometimes insisted the sky was yellow when everybody else um, was seeing it as blue. There's a relationship between the wavelength of light and what you experience. And you'd think it was a bit odd if you had a friend who sometimes insisted they heard birds singing when a cat meowed. Um, there's a relationship between pressure waves and the experiences that you have. 
And so you'd probably find it odd if you had a friend who smashed his hand with a hammer, but sometimes insisted it didn't hurt, and then occasionally collapsed when they, in agony when they stepped into sunlight. You'd be rather concerned about that person. You might wonder if they really were a person at all. And the moral here is that pain and injury are not arbitrarily stacked together, or at least to suggest that they are um, is a bit of an odd um, suggestion. There does seem to be an important relationship um, between nociception and pain. This is actually an old um, discussion, as Voltaire asked Descartes and some machinists, as nature arranged all the means of feeling this animal so that it may not um, feel. Um, Descartes never answered. That's because he was dead by the time Voltaire asked him. Another issue that's come up is that whether or not the cortex is really necessary. I added this slide this morning because uh, Merker came up um, a few times, and Merker has been the person who's argued most strongly, along with Ionetti, that the, perhaps the cortex isn't really necessary for um, um, a, a, a pain experience. And he's based part of his work um, on the, pres the absence of the cortex in babies born with anencephalic um, brains, where the brain gets gobbled up um, by cerebral spinal fluid. And in these infants, um, some of them survive, um, and they clearly show, um, says Merka, evidence of emotional um, responses. Um, this, this infant here um, is the anencephalic infant. She's certainly um, awake. Um, she's having an emotional reaction. But whether there's a phenomenal consciousness there, I think, is harder um, to really um, address. Um, this it, it, picture here shows, apparently, um, a young infant um, making eye contact with his mother um, and smiling as a consequence of it. Except he isn't making eye contact because he's born congenitally blind. Um, this is a sham um, gaze that you're looking at here. And I, I do wonder whether there's something shammy about these um, emotions as well in these anencephalic um, infants. Um, hard to know what's really um, going on in these situations. But I think one possible solution, and this has also been discussed um, earlier today, is to suggest that maybe there are two pains that we're talking about. One pain is an entirely raw, apprehended but not comprehended, sense-certain type um, sensation. And if you want an illustration of what I mean there, you just think right now about the, the fact that your um, backside um, has some pressure on it. You probably weren't aware of the fact that your backside has some pressure on it until I mentioned it. But now that I've mentioned it, you're like, oh, yeah, um, there is some pressure on my backside. I, I can feel that. So the question is, well, were you feeling it um, before um, or were you not feeling it before? And there seems to be, in a, in a sense, you were feeling it before. You can just keep going up higher and higher with these kinds of things. Now that I've mentioned um, the perception in your backside, you're aware of it. And now maybe you can become aware of the fact that you're aware of the perception in your backside. And then you can become aware of the fact that you're aware of the fact that you're aware of the perception in your backside, and so on and so forth, all the way up until you eventually um, explode. There's always another layer, it seems, above um, where you are at the moment. This is not an entirely idea that I've come up with. Ray Tallis as well has talked about this idea. He makes the distinction between simply being cold and knowing that you are cold. Being that and knowing that. Knowing that is a completely conscious, self-referential sense um, of being in a particular state. So maybe fish pain is like that, and maybe that's different from um, human pain. So for the pain for the fish, it's an immediate, raw state of being. It just is, and what it is is nothing more than what it is. Maybe this is like the qualia um, that have been popping up in this conference earlier today. But for humans, um, pain is embedded in a general belief of system about bodies, functions, work, and so on. It's in a general emotional framework that includes fear, anxiety, hope, and so on. And it's in a general cognitive system that includes memory, attention, reflection, and so on. Human pain is extensive. It's more than what it just is. And I think that the, the cheat, the trick, um, is to draw an equivalence between these two things. I don't think they are um, equivalent. They're, they're different. And if you talk about pain and don't make it clear whether you mean this, whether you mean this, then there's a bit of a cheat going on. You're cashing in the fact that we don't interrogate these terms um, deeply um, enough. Okay, so in conclusion, I'm a pain guy, remember, so I'm worried about pain research. And pain research, I think, is trapped um, between the rock of objectivity <laughs> and the hard place of subjectivity. 
Um, if we boil pain down to neural circuits, we tend to boil out the person who feels. That's the problem with specificity theory. But if we make pain entirely subjective, then the relationship of pain to injury becomes unreasonably arbitrary. That's the problem with subjectivity theory. Neither position, I think, is satisfactory, and perhaps both positions, um, as it happens, are wrong. Perhaps in order to solve these questions about what it is to feel, what it is to think, what it is to be conscious, we need to radically rethink the objective um, and the subjective. I've done a little bit of that. Um, I still find fish pain too much of a reach, no matter how I try and mix up um, the question. But that's the end now. Thank you very much for your attention. from Latin, poina, and the use for something bad in general in English is as old as the use for what we now think of as pain sensation. So in a way, I think it's something of a cheat to use, to put, uh, to rest arguments about fish on this English word, which goes in both directions toward affect, toward what one thinks of as bad for one in general and toward something that one might think is an affect, a sensation, neither or both, that fish might have. Yeah, I was worried about this. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, I understand the point that, that in other languages the, the term isn't quite as extensive, but I don't know of any language where there's not uh, different components to the experience, and I don't know any language where there isn't a reflection um, on that experience. I mean, when you go to see your doctor, the typical process is to say where it hurts and how long it's been hurting for and what that hurt is like and so on. Um, so I think that's an important part of our medico-human culture. And I don't think that is um, how fish <laughs> experience it. Now, if you want to say the fish experiences pain, fine, but then how would you define it for them? Well, certainly one wouldn't expect fish to meet the IASP description of their having learned vocabulary in the process of their maturation. But one might, uh, but one similarly wouldn't think that a child who is defective in language learning couldn't experience pain if the trouble is mainly in its language system. So that's the sort of thing one has to consider for comparison, not this full thing for someone who has lang full language faculty, but rather the response, but rather the sort of experience that we might have separated from that even in humans. That felt more like a comment than a question, sorry. Um, I'm curious where you draw the line. Do you think uh, mammals, all mammals, or only higher mammals, or amphibi amphibians, reptiles? Where do you draw the line? Yeah, so the question where we draw the line, I think, boils down to how you're defining your term. And I, I, I know it gets really tedious to keep saying this, and I, I, I do get a bit bored with it myself, but it, if you're going to define pain in the way the ISP does, well, then it's just us. And then, it, yeah, I agree with the speaker in the middle. Then it feels like it's too much, right? I mean, that's, that's just going too far. So then we've got to define it in some other way. And if you define it in as a, just an immediate sensory experience, just is what it is, which I'm, I'm tempted to do that, and I quite like that kind of definition, well, then, then you're looking at creatures where, like Victoria described this morning, have shown that they have the apparatus for it and have shown... Um, that they can change their behavior in, in response to what is going on. So that, that I think, is, is, is okay. I still feel like, in, in, even in that situation, there's a real danger of extrapolating that up to the types of experiences that, that we have. And, and that, that worries me. Do dogs feel pain? Well, again, you've got to <laughs> ask no, me I'm asking question. you, yeah, do dogs feel pain, yes uh, or no? Do, <laughs> uh, oh, okay, well, if you're going to ask me yes or no, I'll just say no. I, I've asked that question yeah. to a whole range of people because I've had arguments. There are some 
uh, individuals who will remain nameless who will tell me that monkeys don't feel pain. No one has pain except humans because they don't have enough insula, for example. But uh, you know, when you ask a dog lover, does your dog feel pain? And if you, if, I, I defy you to find a single person who owns a dog who will tell you that their dog doesn't feel pain. So I, I really think that is counterintuitive. Quite I agree with you. Yeah, it is counterintuitive, but you refuse to define your terms. So, if you're just going to ask me a yes okay. or no question, okay. When you when you terms, when you when no. you when you stub your toe, and you have an unpleasant feeling, and you and your dog gets his paw caught in a door, does he have an unpleasant feeling? He or she, excuse me, he or she have an unpleasant feeling? Yes or no? Are you that confident that you're going to put your dog's paw in a door? Oh, but I wouldn't put my dog's paw on the door for all kinds of reasons. Well, why not? If he doesn't have pain, well, what, I what do you? Smash a window either. I don't think it mm. feels pain. You know, it's just like it's a general welfare. So you you you're not willing to give the dog pain. <laughs> you still haven't defined your term. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm I won't trap my dog's <laughs> paw on the door. It's okay, not much. Um, you compared it to the visual system that they have to learn to see after having cataract removed, right? But I'm not sure that's a fair comparison because the visual system, you know, th that has to analyze the scene in great detail. And if you have formed the uh, right synapses and trained the system for a long time, you're not, it's not able to analyze it. But it, um, th the pain system may be very, very different. It makes a lot of evolutionary sense that that should be hardwired to make a reaction and uh, of ungenerated unpleasant uh, feelings from the very beginning. It's an un, uh, it's a unlearned, it's a uh, uh, unconditioned stimulus, right? Uh, and so I don't think it's a fair comparison. And the second thing you are talking about in humans, this is uh, pain is all, the feeling of pain is all embedded in, uh, you know, memories and with language and all that. Well, that's, that's, that's uh, true, of course, but uh, I think the, component that's sort of ethically relevant here and that causes the uh, harm for the individual's uh, subjective experience uh, is uh, all the other things are pretty irrelevant for that. You know, that, that is sort of added to it, which is uh, on top of the essential thing that they're talking about is more irrelevant. Okay, so you said a lot there, but let, let me just pick up on the first part. I mean, so sure, uh, may vision and pain, I'm not saying they're exactly the same. I have made the case, I think they're both complex. Again, it depends exactly how it is you're going to define one or the other. So you could define vision in a much low, more low-level manner, uh, which would make it more relevant to animals that have less complex eyes, for example, and I think that would be a fair thing to do. But unfortunately, we don't have people who've been born without nociceps and then had them replaced, so we don't know what would happen in that situation. But we have had people who've been born without vision and had it replaced, and we do know what happens in that situation. I think it's counterintuitive that they have to learn to see even very relatively um, simple objects. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but just a uh, finger on the... <laughs> but there are also evidence that they can see uh, patients with that they have the cataracts removed, they can see colors immediately. So maybe not all the features of their vision is they have to learn. Oh, sure, yeah, they're, they're not blind. I mean, they do, they do see things. No, yeah. there are yeah. monkeys too. Yeah. They can see colors immediately. They do transmutation of immediately. They can see lines too, I mean, you know, yeah. Well, thanks for your talk. Um, my question is, uh, there's a certain tendency in child molesters, for example, to downplay the suffering that they're causing. So they would claim, for example, that the children enjoy whatever they do to them. And do you think that it's possible that there is a similar psychological um, process happening when we are discussing fish pain while we are eating fish, for example? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't equate fish eaters with child molesters. <laughs> sure. I want to ask a question. So, so <laughs> you were surprisingly liberal about ascribing experiences to fish. You, you described them as, as, as having experiences. 
that usually comes with uh, some form of, uh, you know, people usually mean that there's some form of subjectivity there. So, yeah. <laughs> that was the word you used. <laughs> well, I mean, I do honestly think there's a, a real problem with talking about um, animal consciousness of any, any kind because um, the trouble is we have to use language. And, of course, the one thing that animals don't have is, is a language, or at least not one that's as sophisticated as ours. And so immediately they start talking about it. You introduce terms that you don't really mean to introduce um, to um, the animal that you're talking about. You tend to overdo it. I mean, a good example of this uh, discussing over lunch is representation. We talk about representation. Representation isn't the same as presentation. Presentation is more immediate. Um, a presentation just is what it is. You don't reflect on the fact that it's not the actual thing that you're looking at. You know, I don't confuse um, this lectern in front of me, my vision of it, with the actual thing in itself. That's the representation. But if an animal uh, has a representation, then presumably they're also not making that confusion. But I don't think we have the grounds to make those kinds of arguments. For the animal, why not just have a straightforward presentation that it never considers to be different from the thing in itself? I mean, we do this all the time. We talk about animals. Um, so this morning, for example, Andrew spoke about um, it makes sense for the ant to remove something dead from the nest, which implies that the, maybe the ant understands the difference between death and alive. But I don't think we believe that ants have a crisis about death and living. They just do what they do in response to the smell or the pheromones that come its way. So all the time, I think, in, in language, we're introducing terms um, that mean more than what could conceivably be um, given to um, the animal in question. Yes, question. Well, this is my dog, Sophia. So when we were standing in line this morning, somebody stepped on her foot. And she let out a very large, piercing sound, which got all the humans' attention. What would you say she was experiencing in that moment? I don't know. You know, I mean, that's that's uh, <laughs> again, it's a question of what it is we define. But I don't think it was worried um, that it was going to end up in hospital. It wasn't going to be able to do um, its doggy things later. That it was concerned that maybe its foot was broken, or that it was going, "Ow, God damn it, get off my foot!" Those kinds of things were not happening. And that's that's what humans do when they experience those kinds of things. And I, I think you can say there's something akin to pain going on there, but to draw an equivalence is to overstate it. But then people would, like 100 years ago, people operated on dogs without any anesthesia because they had the opinion that there was no pain. So I think we have to do something about that kind of thinking. Speaker is Colin Allen, who uh, works is a philosopher working on the um, foundations of cognitive science and, uh, and neuroscience. Uh, originally a philosopher of biology, um, and he's somewhere in the middle between these last two speakers. All right. So thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, and uh, also for the, the two talks, and actually the talks this morning too, which set up rather nicely many of the things that I want to do um, in this talk, and it'll enable me to go a little bit faster through some of the slides, and therefore maybe some, some time for discussion. Before I get started, I want to make clear to the people at home that this is water, not gin. <laughs> it's what they gave us, it's what they gave the speakers at lunchtime, so. <laughs> Good. No pain. Well, we've seen already just now a little bit of the argument that we're engaged in here, which is between what I call proponents of the idea that fish feel pain. Um, Victoria Braithwaite, this is the cover of her book, and a very representative statement. There's as much evidence that fish feel pain and suffer as there is for birds and mammals. Um, and on the right-hand side here, I've got a paper by uh, James Rose and colleagues uh, from a couple of years ago, or five years ago now, um, in which they maintain claims that fish feel pain remain unsubstantiated. <laughs> And, and what you've really seen already uh, this afternoon is on the one side, uh, people like Victoria pointing to a lot of similar behavior between fish and, uh, and uh, other animals, including ourselves, when they are uh, challenged with some sort of putatively uh, um, noxious stimulus, um, and some degree of argumentation about neurological similarity, leading them to conclude that, yes, there is fish pain. 
And on the other side, uh, a claim that that's anthropomorphizing the behavior. So when we appropriately de-anthropomorphize it and pay attention to the neurological dissimilarities, we can conclude that there's no fish pain. So today, I'm going to take a sort of pox on both houses side. Um, maybe that's a little harsh, because people do concede a little bit to the other side, so at least a mild flu on both houses. Um, and you're going to see that what I say is probably going to be more targeted at the skeptics, because I think that they tend to be a little bit more, pardon the pun, dogmatic on these issues. Um, so while I think that both sides need to make a better case, and I'll try to explain how, um, they, uh, I'm going to be focusing a lot on what's going on on the, uh, on the skeptic side. And so here we have Stuart um, from his paper in Stebbins' uh, wonderful new journal, Animal Sent uh, Sentience, um, saying fish pain will not involve any explicitly identifiable negative sensations, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be mu much less in uh, elaborate, something apprehended but not comprehended. You heard him say this just a few moments ago. Um, and he also says in that paper, any fish experience will be part of a, of a fragment unconnected to a psychological self and thus quite unlike our experiences. It should not be called pain. And that's really the discussion you just heard, right? The, the, there's a terminological issue here. It's clearly far from the typical pain experience that we know, he says. Um, and so there is very much this question of what it is that um, we're talking about realizing here. And I, I like to remind people here, most people in the, who work in comparative animal cognition know Morgan's can and Conway's, Conway Lloyd Morgan in uh, 1894 said we should never attribute to an animal something higher when we can explain its behavior, behavior by something lower. What most people don't know is that in the chapter before he presented that, he wrote about consciousness and w actually thought there was a kind of consciousness throughout all of the animal kingdom. But he says there's some level below which we just can't mentally project ourselves, and so we should just be quiet about that. But uh, he certainly thought that many animals close to ourselves experienced forms of consciousness similar enough to ours that it was worth discussing. And while not exactly the same, we want to pull out the similarities and the differences, not just sort of set a hard mark and, and uh, say nothing below humans. Um, and we also heard this morning from uh, Todd Feinberg, um, this is the book, The Ancient Origins of Consciousness. What you heard this morning is that uh, Feinberg and Mallet are very willing to attribute a kind of sensory consciousness and also um, interceptive consciousness to a wide range of vertebrates all the way back to the earliest jawed vertebrates, the, the fish. Um, and they say in this book, they have a very short section on, on animal pain. It's about a page long. Um, all of the, excuse me, fish pain. All of the jawed vertebrates could have fast, sharp pain. Um, but they go on to say, however, fish seem to lack the pain associated with suffering. And of course, from an ethical point of view, it's the suffering kind of pain that we mostly are interested in. But their report here is really just reporting uh, from the Rose and colleague paper from 2012 that I already mentioned. Uh, it's based on reports of low C fiber count. Um, and here we see um, uh, a discussion of that in the Rose paper. So C fibers are the uh, unmyelinated neurons that, from your periphery that lead to the kind of longer, slower pain associated with injury rather than the first sharp sort of prick of a pin. Um, and they say it's reasonable to ask of what functional significance the extremely small number of C fibers might be in fishes. It appears most logical to assume that in Telios, at least those species that have been studied, uh, A delta, which are the fast kind afferents, serve to signal potentially injurious events rapidly, thereby triggering escape and avoidance responses. But the paucity of C fibers that mediate slow, agonizing second pain and pathological pain states in organisms capable of consciousness is not a functional domain of nociception in, in fishes. And I, I want to uh, partly dismiss this as talking about the periphery when really the action, as more recently realized, is in, in the central systems, the, the brain systems in particular. Um, but also, um, there's nothing in this that says there couldn't be something of negative affect, just not long-lasting negative affect in the fast-acting uh, um, uh, fibers. So. When they say it appears most logical to assume, I want to say, really? Um, because we also know that unmyelinated C fibers are associated with sensory systems besides nociception, for, for instance, detecting warming and itching. Um, and so we might account for the much greater number of C fibers in 
uh, non-fish species as being geared towards those systems rather than nociception per se. Um, and I want to point out, and this came up earlier also this morning, that the general sensory requirements for terrestrial animals are really different from those for aquatic animals. So air and gravity basically change everything. You have to support yourself. You have to have all these articulated limbs to do it. Um, you've got less oxygen around. Uh, you have rapid temperature fluctuations. You have to deal with balance and proprioception and all sorts of ways that fish do not have to deal with that. And so you would expect a whole bunch more machinery just to deal with being on land, basically. Um, and I want to also emphasize something else that came up uh, in Eva Jabonka's talk, but it, uh, also in some of the others, the importance of timing. So not only are there A delta and C fibers, there's also A, which are highly myelinated fibers that work very rapidly. So we have to think about the time scales in which these systems have to work to understand why they have the particular distribution of receptors that they do. But as I mentioned, I really want to get to the central argument, which is this uh, represented by this claim from James Rose from 2002, the fundamental neural requirements for pain and suffering are now known, he asserted. Fishes lack the most important of these required neural structures and they have no alternative neural structures for producing the pain experience. Therefore, the reactions of fishes to noxious stimuli are nociceptive and without conscious awareness of pain. So here comes a caveat. Fishes are an enormously diverse taxon. Right? Something like 60% of all vertebrate species. Um, and this is a figure that um, we might have seen already today from Rose's 2002 paper that he basically cribbed from an earlier paper, showing four different fish brains from quite different taxa. So you've got a ray um, on the left, a goldfish next to it, a trout next to it, and a lungfish on the right. Um, and uh, <coughs> one of the claims that Rose makes is that the lungfish has a very primitive, undifferentiated brain. But compared to what we learned earlier today about the amphioxus brain, which really is more primitive and undifferentiated, there's actually quite a lot of structure in there. Lungfish are also particularly interested because they're on the tetrapod branch that leads to us. Okay? Um, and so there's, there's a really different trajectory evolutionarily there than is being than is represented elsewhere. And it's also, I think, really important to recognize that goldfish up here on the left, um, the trout on the right, and the ray below also relate to the evolutionary tree of fishes uh, very much towards the lower parts of that. So nothing here of those brains represents something going on in the, the neo, so-called neoteleos or upper teleos. Um, and a lot of the examples that we heard about earlier are actually um, from much higher up in this diagram here in terms of interesting behavior. And we really don't know very much about the, bain, the brain structures that support that behavior in, that, in those groups. So you saw, I don't have to go into this in detail, you saw Victoria talk about the cooperation between the uh, grouper and the mare eel in the Red Sea. The mare is actually sort of down over here in the eels and on the left-hand side, um, and the, uh, the grouper is over there in the Persiforms, right? It's a, it's a kind of bass. Um, and so these are quite different uh, parts of the evolutionary tree engaging in a complex sort of interactive behavior um, that deserves some further study to understand the neural basis of it. And by bringing the eel in, I also want to point out that I'm not saying anything that's outside this yellow bubble here doesn't have the wherewithal for complex cognition and possibly consciousness and possibly therefore uh, conscious pain, right? Um, I want to say we just don't know as much as we really should know to be making firm conclusions here. And we also saw this diagram. It's also from Rose. Um, it was presented to us earlier by Stuart as a sort of a schematized uh, uh, fish brain. It's actually the brain of a trout, 30 centimeters long, if you read the Rose paper. Um, not the brain, the fish, um, 30 centimeters long. Um, and it's drawn to scale with the human brain. Um, but this is a little graph that I did in conjunction with my colleague Tom Schoenemann where we plotted fish brains, all the purple um, points, um, alongside uh, what, what was already known about mammal relative to body size. And you'll see that fish lie exactly along the line for all of the endothermic, excuse me, ectothermic cold-blooded organisms. Um, so the, this lower line basically includes the reptiles and also what we know about dinosaurs from brain cavities. Um, and there are fish here that clearly have larger brains than some mammals, which are the light blue green dots. Um, so if size matters, they've got big enough brains, some of them at least, to be comparable to the mammals. And many of them are even further off that regression line than we are off, right? So we are this uh, 
left dot that's sort of, uh, there's a string of dots across the left, mostly those are uh, whales and dolphins, and we're on the left of that, okay? So back to the central argument then, um, this claim that neocortical structures are necessary for, for conscious pain, and fish lack neocortical structures, therefore fish lack consciousness, um, really brings up this issue of what's the relationship between structure and function. And we heard a number of ideas already today having to do with, uh, uh, perhaps it being more to do with the system level properties rather than you know, some part of the brain that is the substrate for consciousness. Um, and so what I want to point out here is that if you're going to amend the argument um, against fish pain, you first got to admit that, that, that these structures are necessary for conscious pain in mammals, perhaps, right? Pache the, the, and, and, and um, anencephalic uh, uh, individuals. And the amended premise Brock's conclusion if the conscious pain can be realized in non neocortical structures. And we actually see this move in the 2012 paper, excuse me, 2016 paper by Key, which is one of the early papers published in Stevens' uh, uh, journal, Animal Sentience, where he, he moves to talking about them lacking the necessary cytoarchitecture, microcircuitry, structural connectivity, et cetera, and lacking the parcellation of the nervous system into distinct regions. It's interesting that. In making that case, he points again to points of this taxonomic tree that are all outside the upper teleos. Um, and uh, all of the examples, uh, as I said, that Victoria gave of interesting behavior are all in the upper teleos. Um, there's clearly more to be looked at there. Um, so why not pain? I've already said that Feinberg and Mallet uh, uh, rule something out because they actually just borrow from the idea that, uh, um, that Rose and colleagues put forward, that there's just not enough C fibers to make it plausible. Um, um, but on the other hand, we've already heard that they think that there's extraceptive sensory consciousness and interoceptive or visceral consciousness. Um, and so it's a very circumstantial case against fish pain, it seems to me. And this is where we get into the concept of the neuromatrix. So now I'm overlapping with, <laughs> with the immediately preceding talk. But I think that when we think about the neuromatrix, a systems level approach, what we find in the human brain under pain is huge, many different regions of the brain being activated during uh, pain, uh, painful stimulation. And I want to agree with uh, Andy Barron this morning that uh, we should be taking a connectomic view of the, the, the dynamics of that matter. Um, and importantly, um, so this is Ianetti and Moreau uh, reviewing the neuromatrix, saying it started off as an idea about a general neuromatrix. It moved to a kind of pain-specific neuromatrix, but, but there's evidence that it really should go back to being a general neuromatrix. It's not just about pain, this system. And so if we understand how pain fits into the larger organismic systems level of the, of the uh, organism, then we can start looking at uh, fish in a more sophisticated way, I believe. So my unsatisfying conclusion is that pain in non-mammals needn't be a matter of having or lacking homologous structures to mammalian neocortex. Some alternative functional architectures could support the dynamics of painful experience. Uh, maybe the bees, maybe the birds um, would provide good examples of this. Um, but fishes are vastly underexplored. Only a small handful have been looked at behaviorally and even fewer in terms of their actual neuroanatomy. So I want to say not enough is really known to draw any firm conclusions at this point. So I'm left painful in the middle, right, disagreeing with both sides. Um, but I think if we're thinking about how to do this, we really need to get specific. We, don't, we shouldn't be talking about fish pain. We should be talking about not even grouper pain because that's about... 40 species, if I remember correctly, as well. We need to understand the individual capacities of the particular species in their ecological context with the dynamics that are important to solving the problems they have to solve. So that's my bottom line. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Alexander, right here. Oh. Or somebody's got the microphone. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Um, I like where you're going with that. I wondered, though, at the very end where, <laughs> right, uh, why end with species? Why is then, why are you bring it down from the group of fish to a species of fish? Why not cultures of fish? Or, or dare I say it, like an individual fish? 
Sure, one step at a time, or maybe it's three <laughs> steps at a time. But no, I, I but agree. certainly there those are as important. Absolutely, there are going to be individual differences, and one of the interesting things about, say, hypersensitivity to pain in human subjects is that. Um, it was talked about earlier, the importance of the ACC. I want to fight the idea that the ACC is the locus of, of the suffering, but it's clearly engaged in a system level way with assessments of the degree of awfulness of the experience. And those individuals have a lot more activity accordingly, not just in ACC, but also in prefrontal cortex, and actually in some out-of-sensory cortex too, so it fits with the, with the sensory aspects of pain. So, so again, we look at this at system level, we will find individual differences even with, within humans about how the system is actually working. Absolutely. Thank you, Colin. Um, putting together some points from this morning and, and this afternoon, um, what seems to me to emerge is the following picture. Um, nociceptors make such good sense that we would be very surprised to find any, any locomotors <laughs> that don't have nociceptors. But nociceptors don't make any sense without withdrawal. There has to be some response, some appropriate response to the nociception. That's what makes them nociceptors. Right. Now, we need something more, clearly. But we've heard a good thing, a good uh, amount of uh, complexity described this morning about how, in the case of the bees, they have a whole variety of responses to noxious stimuli. We heard from Peter Godfrey Smith about his interesting suggestion that we have uh, species that are like wasps that are high perception but low evaluative and species maybe like spiders which are just the opposite mm -hmm. and what does it mean to be to be high evaluative it means to have a larger and maybe indefinitely large number of degrees of freedom of how to respond to things mm -hmm. so now let's take our nociceptors and the in the zero case is simple withdrawal it's just a reflex and there's it's on, there's, there's only one degree of freedom just if you have it, you, re you respond, and, and that's all. You're very robotic. Now we move up to uh, uh, Andy's bees, and we see that there's a whole range of behaviors, and more importantly, behavioral controls, mm -hmm. and more important, controls on the controls, mm -hmm. and we get recursive. And now we begin to have some answers to what I think is always the question, if you want to know whether it's pain or not, if you want to know whether it's anything about consciousness, you want to ask and answer the question, and then what happens? Good. And in the case of higher, more complicated animals, in the case where our intuitions strongly suggest, enough happens so that we want to call it pain. Good. So you need to come to my talk at NIH on Monday, um, <laughs> where I'm talking about suffering as a concept, where I think actually it is this interaction between planning control mechanisms and Sorry. evaluative mechanisms. Um, and so we want to look at the way in which, in fact, intense suffering can come about from really minor stimuli if you can't get rid of them. This is how <laughs> water drip tortures kind of work, right? So, so the range of freedom that you have to deal with it, right, is I think importantly correlated with this. And, and fish in many ways, don't have as many degrees of freedom because their bodies aren't as articulated anyway. I think an awful lot, this brings me to an embodied kind of perspective as well, because I think an awful lot of dealing with long-lasting pain and injury is finding a position in which things are comfortable. And when you can't, it's extremely unpleasant, right? So, so I want to, I, I fully agree with the suggestion, and I think we actually can begin to build a, a case for this as an account of what's going on in mammals, and I think in birds, because I think there are, um, analogous structures, and I think we just don't know enough about fish to say which fish do or don't have which parts of this overall architecture. Yeah, good. Let's not get too ecumenical here. There's room for disagreement. That's why I'm in the middle getting attacked on both sides. It's not, this is not a conference on what is and isn't suffering. The sliding uh, threshold for suffering is another story. But for Don, what else happens? 
it's not just more and more things you can do to stimulation. At some point, you start feeling something, and that's what sentience is, and that's what we're here about. Not about all of the varieties of ways that we can respond to stimuli. So I'm, I agree, I think if I understand what the dispute is between the two of you. Um, I love Dan, I agree with everything that he says. This one I can't, this just one. can't do it. <laughs> so, so I didn't want to make it this about suffering, which is why I didn't give the, the same two talks, right? Um, but I, uh, I wanted to sort of agree with the idea that you can have, um, and maybe the Dan wouldn't go along with this, it sounds like I'm more on, on your side in this, you can have basic short-lived negative affect states, the ouch, if you like, right, which are very quickly resolved um, by getting out of the situation, perhaps. But then you can have all sorts of ramifications if the damage is last lo long-lasting or if there are uh, long-term changes in the neural junctions that mean that you have chronic pain without any obvious manifestation of, of, uh, of an actual injury, right? These are the clinical cases that actually prompted the IASP to sort of uh, define things the way they do, then I think um, you, you're off into a whole different area, which is the suffering area. I, I completely agree with that. But the basic raw felt fain, pain, which has to do with um, being a, the kind of organism that has to respond over a range of time scales to um, some potentially harmful stimuli and possibly nurse injuries. That's what's so interesting about the fish rubbing their lips and so on or assuming a kind of rocking posture, right? That, that's presumably a recuperative thing which would be driven by this kind of experience. Now, in all of that, I'm taking a kind of basic affective possibility for granted, which I get from all sorts of people at this conference, Abel Jablonka, uh, Jablonka's work and uh, Feinberg and Mallet's work and so on, right? I sort of, I'm taking that for granted. I'm not trying to answer the real skeptical question. I'm trying to say, what should we look for in fish to, to find the neural bases for similar kinds of uh, uh, systems? So I, I, I think one of the problems here is that we have the bookends, right? We've got the sort of, sort of the suffering end that we use in medicine, and then you've got this sharp, short pain side. I'll give you an analogy. Um, the 1A afferent system that is re responsible for the stretch reflex can act segmentally, and if you have diabetes, for example, you can lose that segmental stretch reflex. Mm -hmm. But that very same neural activity will go up into the brain um, and give you position sense. Mm -hmm. And it's far worse if you lose the cortical use of that same sensory input for position sense than to use your stretch reflex when it's low in the hierarchy. Similarly, you need that sense presumably for things like embodiment, body sense, and sense of body. So in other words, the same sensory input can have very different com consequences based on what the area of the brain does to use that input. And so I think what we need is to make a sort of almost normative decision about which computation on that nociceptive input are we going to consider when we find grain break it down like it did for the 1A afferent and call it unacceptable? For example, if you get chemotherapy and you lose your stretch reflex, we as physicians will say that's an acceptable consequence for the chemotherapy. If you lose your position sense, that's devastating and we probably won't give the medication. So we, it's not about looking at the brain. It's not about... It, you're going to have to have a fine-grained behavioral notion of what these computational consequences are, and then from the outside decide whether they're all terrible or whether only some of them are, like we do for humans as well. Um, and I just don't think we have that fine grain because I've noticed in all these conversations it's either suffering at one end and up in the cortex or it's just withdrawal down at the bottom and very little granularity in between. Yeah, I'm completely sympathetic to that comment. I think, though... Um, that, uh, that I want to avoid getting into the terminological dispute because, because I don't regard this as sort of two separate systems. There's, there's layer upon layer upon layer of the processing, and some simple reflexes can be purely spinal, and I'm prepared to believe, therefore, completely without any kind of consciousness. Um, even some learning goes on spinally, but not the kind of higher forms of learning um, that, uh, that uh, have also been mentioned earlier today. Um, so, so, I, so we can describe the system at a much finer grain. You're absolutely right about that. And then this is also a way that I have framed things in the past and will do again on Monday, 
is I think what often happens in these debates is that there's a, there's a science premise that says animals do or don't have some characteristic. And there's an ethics premise that says this characteristic is or isn't important for, for ethics. And there's often a, not an easy way to link those two. So what's sort of scientifically acceptable is not obviously of ethical relevance or vice versa. And I don't think, it's, I don't think the ethical case is just a matter of decision either, though. So I would disagree with with sort of we just have to decide. I think we need careful reasoned argument about why we might actually think even this lower form, less sophisticated form of response is something to be avoided if it can be avoided, but, but there would be reasons for overriding that avoidance principle that wouldn't give you a reason for, you know, putting a dog in an electric shock chamber as was done, you know, in the 70s quite a lot, right, and just letting it there, there until it starts defecating, right? So, so there, there were horrible, horrible experiments, I think, that, that we, we can sort of clearly say why they're, why they're bad. And there's going to be, as always, a, a fair amount of gray area, but that's, that's where the ethical discussion has to go on, because it's trade-offs. Okay, let's thank our... Ask the question of the panel. Well, I mean, but Ned may have one. Where's Victoria? That's all I can do. I'll keep going. Okay, well, to begin, do, you, do the panelists have questions for each other? Well, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll ask. Your, your mic doesn't seem to be on. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll ask Victoria. I mean, would would you make a distinction between um, the experience of a fish, however you define it, and the experience of a human, however you would define it? Yes, I would. And I've never said that fish feel pain in the way that a human does. It couldn't. It doesn't have the sophisticated brain. Um, so, so I absolutely would make a distinction, but um, I, uh, as I've said before, I will, I will stand by um, that I think there is um, sufficient evidence to indicate that fish do experience something negative and that they have a feeling associated with that, an emotional response, oh, hang on, sorry, not using that word, an emotional <laughs> response associated with that. And uh, to me, that is a pain of sorts, but it's not human pain, and I wouldn't say, oh, oh, so I w we agree with that. Yeah. So then, I mean, why, why do we use the term pain? So I, let's, use, let's find another term. I'm happy to find another term. Why do we say that other animals walk? I mean, there's, there's similarity. Because they walk. Well, right. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but other yeah. animals have a range of responses I mean, that are not they, exactly the same as they, ours. They have, they have right? hearts that beat, and, you know, and they, they have yeah. blood. And, you know, I mean, yeah, but I don't, I don't buy that as a, a good way of dealing with the problem. I mean, if nobody in this room, I think, believes that the mental experiences of animals are identical to those of humans, and I think that there's at least a legitimate debate to be had about in what way do they differ importantly. And so the question on the table is, is, is the difference here between human and animal pain important? And if it is, then let's find another term. So importance here can have many dimensions as well. So important for what? Important for ethics is one question. Um, important for understanding the operation of our own systems is another question. Uh, so the similarities between mammalian brains and our own are extremely important um, for, for that second uh, thing. And, 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 and we can also, I think, begin to look at the, um, I mean, I'll use this word again, sort of the dynamics of experience, and we can look at the way in which all of these different responses that animals have to various kinds of inputs leads to long-lasting changes in behavior or relatively short ones or <coughs> no long-lasting change at all, just a reflex, and, and map out those similarities and differences. In the end, if you want the word, I'll know what you mean by pain, but that, that also doesn't settle the ethical question because these other things that you're not willing to call, call pain, but lots of people in this room are willing to call pain, will turn out to be ethically significant in that way. But does Stuart agree that um, fish have unpleasant experiences? I'm not clear on that. 
<laughs> Unpleasant <laughs> subjective experiences. So we can disagree about whether there's an emotional component or a cognitive component, or maybe there's some range of different things you would call pain in the cognitive sense, in the emotional sense, but the minimal sense, unpleasant subjective experiences. Do you agree to that or not? An unpleasant sense, oh, oh God, what was it you said again? Unpleasant <laughs> subjective experience. Unpleasant subjective experience. If by subjective you mean a self-reflective experience, then... No, no, no. no. no, no okay, no. then... then Unpleasant if, feeling. Uh, yeah, in a, in a minimal sense, yeah, sure. Okay, so then so you all really agree that um, in some sort of very minimal basic sense of pain, fish have pain. Uh, I don't think we do, you know? I, I, Let's open it up to the audience. Yeah. Uh, Dale. Uh, yeah, so this actually started as a, as a question uh, for Colin, but I, th I think it's also a question for Stuart and Victoria might want to comment on it as well. So Colin ended his talk which, which I really did think was a wonderful talk with the usual scientific plea that more research is indicated. Um, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what the research was that was indicated. Now, one thing you said that I certainly agree with is that we need to know lots more about lots more species. That's certainly true. But if we just go back to Victoria's case about this one individual who is a member of one particular species of grouper. My question for you, Colin, is what it would take to nudge what seems to me your rapidly fading agnosticism anyway, uh, into the direction of agreeing w w with, with Victoria. What would be the decisive experience, what, uh, experiment, what would provide additional evidence? And I might just tack on that with Stuart, it seems to me Stuart's objections are sounding, for better or for worse, increasingly philosophical rather than empirical. But if there is something empirical that could be brought to bear that would bring you to the other side, Stuart, it would be wonderful if you would share it. So I'll go first then. Um, so yes, my agnosticism is, is a, I regard that as a kind of holding position. And I think the history of discussions in this area is one where as we find out more about the species that are understudied, we come to understand that there's more similarity than was previously appreciated. Now, in the end, it's, it's going to be a kind of, uh, range of similarity. It's always going to be then a judgment call about what you think is the appropriate um, uh, thing to say when it comes to ethical questions and so on. But I, I for one, am willing to bet that, you know, if the work is done, and I'll tell you what I think the work is in, in 10 years, I'll be quite happy to say that groupers are, you know, capable of feeling pain consciously. Now, what do I want to see done? What I want to see done is uh, investigation of species that are close enough to grouper or members of the grouper family, which, um, tell me both about the structural, functional anatomy of, of the brain um, in much the same kind of way as Andy is doing for the bees, right? I want to know how this system works, right? I don't want to be pointed to one part of the human brain saying they don't have that, right? I want to know how does this system feed into this range of behaviors such as I think it was a trout you showed us that was uh, eating the shrimp, the spiny shrimp, right? So, so you know, I find the trout behavior also quite compelling, um, but it's an instantaneous, like, that could be a kind of reflexive reaction. I don't see any long-term, uh, um, so, so the two have to come together, and, and we're going to get a story about responses over a time range that uh, lead to, you know, not just, uh, reflexive withdrawal, but so-called nociffensive behaviors, so ways of avoiding and protecting yourself against future uh, harm. Um, and I, I, in the end, I, it's because it's a, more of a continuum thing. I'm not going to sort of say, okay, this is definitely going to prove it, but it's going to be so similar in these respects that, that seem to me to be uh, preponderance of evidence leaning towards pain-feeling grouper. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I think coming back to this this question. So, I, when when I say things like if you wouldn't draw an equivalence between humans and animals, most people are like, yeah, okay, that that's that's ridiculous. And then when we go in the other direction and say that animals don't feel anything, have anything like what we have, that also seems ridiculous. So we're trying to meet somewhere in the middle. 
And I think what, what the problem I'm having is, is that I feel there's a very large distance from us um, to animals and to fish. And I don't think we're respecting how big um, that distance is. That, that's, that's the difficulty I'm having. What would it be that would make me think that distance is smaller um, than everybody else seems to, th than I currently think it is? Um, well, human beings are very explicit in the way in which we experience things. We make what we're experiencing very clear. We radically alter our environment to make it nicer to us. We create lecture theatres that are heated so we're warm in the winter, and um, we have a microphone so you can hear me at the back, and so on and so forth. We recognise very explicitly all the different things um, that we are and want to be. We make changes to do that. So I'd, I guess that's what I'd want to see as something in the animal world that was very explicit in that way, that made it abundantly clear that they were feeling something, know that they're feeling it, and doing something about it. And that I don't see any evidence of at all. And that's why I think the distance is very, very large. So I, I just want to, it's, it's connected to this, and, it's, and, and it, it's, I think why I'm interested in this question is because I'm interested in trying to determine when something suffers. And I'm interested in that because from an ethical point of view, I don't want that animal to suffer because of the way I house it, handle it, whatever I'm doing, and the way I kill it. Um, so reframing this question and thinking about can we determine which animals are suffering in the way that that animal suffers, not as a human, but the way that that animal has the capacity to suffer and how that matters is, I think, where I'm coming from with this. So I, it doesn't matter to me that a fish can't feel pain the way that a human does, and it doesn't matter to me that a dog doesn't feel pain the way that a human does. I accept that a dog feels pain, and, and, and uh, sorry, I, I accept that a dog can suffer, and I believe a fish is able to suffer in the way that fish suffer. Well, <laughs> Just to push a little bit uh, more, to, more on Stuart. Um, <laughs> You're in the middle. <laughs> just, just, say, just say we accept that, uh, you know, your distinction between, okay, well, there's this raw negative thing, we'll call that a feeling, and then this which uh, fish have, and then there's this more complicated thing involving comprehension and self-reflection that humans have and fish don't have. Well, then I guess the next question is going to be, and that's already an intellectually interesting distinction, but for people who are concerned with the ethical issue, the question then is which, which if either or both of those matter, ethically and um, you know so I can certainly get the intuition that the one that humans have compared to fish matters distinctively that somehow comprehending your pain makes it worse and the reflecting on it has all kinds of ramifications in your life that uh, that make the uh, that make the pain worse and so on on the other hand I also have a pretty strong sense I think it's a sense a whole lot of people have who are familiar with pain that the comprehension of the pain and the reflecting on the pain is not all of what makes the pain bad. That even without the comprehension and even without the self-reflection, there'd be something bad about the raw feeling of the pain. If that's, if that's the case, then if, uh, if fish have the, uh, the raw feeling part without the comprehension and without the self-reflection, then I think you just have to draw the conclusion that feeder, fish are undergoing something bad that we ought to take into account in our moral deliberation about, about fish. So is there, is there anywhere there you would get off the boat? God, that's a big question. Uh, so uh, then I think I would adopt, uh, to some extent, I'd, I'd look at that and say, well, okay, if, if the fish is feeling something, this raw expression, whatever it is, however we try and define it, um, look at the conditions of fish lives. You know, they eat sharp things. Um, they live at deep depths. Um, they travel long distances. They go through various um, extreme temperatures. They suffer um, terrible disease. You know, the, it, the fish has a lot of issues um, in its life. And I don't know if it's ethically, whether it makes any sense for us to draw an ethical conclusion about that. I mean, that just is the way that, that, that nature is, unfortunately, for um, the fish. They don't seem to be that worried about it. Um, they don't seem to organize themselves to do it. They're not attending this conference to put their point of view forward. Um, so I, I, I struggle um, with- Who will speak for the fish? It. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Um, this is a question about the relation uh, between Could, particular can, investigation can of yeah. investigation of particular cases and the most general 
form of thought about consciousness and its its place in the universe. I mean, of course, I mean, as, as, as Colin said, as, as, of course, as Colin said, you have to concentrate on particular species. Any experiment is an experiment on a particular individual, and so on. Um, but, as you also said, it isn't reasonable to infer from the dissimilarities of structure between us and uh, another species that they don't feel pain because they don't have the precise physiological foundation for it that produces it in us. Um, what I wonder is whether one shouldn't uh, take as an important um, contribution to our uh, speculations about the range of variation of physical organisms that may have a particular mental uh, state or phenomenon, some assumption about uh, a broader uniformity of nature. That is, that if we are to understand, um, I mean, that there, that there are uh, some aspects of the mental, uh, if it exists in species other than ourselves, uh, that should have a general, of which there should be some general theory. Um, I mean, uh, this topic is not just the sum of uh, theories of consciousness or pain in humans, in bees, in fish, in uh, God knows what. Um, it, it should aspire, it seems to me, to be part of a more general conception uh, which includes a great deal of variation but has elements that um, are sort of basic and common to many different cases. I mean, pain seems a candidate for one of those things. I mean, just as there are that as that there are chemical processes that are common across uh, many forms of life. Um, well, anyway, the question really is, should that general point of view, should the, uh, the, the location of any study of a particular organism in some general account of consciousness as a natural phenomenon be part of what drives one's speculations? So it's a great question, and I'm always happy to think about these sort of methodological issues in philosophy in particular. Um, I think that um, just as it took an awful lot of work in chemistry to be able to say something about what an element is, you had to study a bunch of things that were putatively elements, not compounds, and and find uh, or uh, and find ways of of uh, understanding what they had in common. So I see that rather more as an end point or a goal that might be driving the 
the, the, uh, the process here. But I also think we have to be very mindful. I think it was John Beatty, but it might have been Dan Dennett, who said there are no laws in biology, and even this one has an exception. Um, so so I, I think that biologists, when they look at the living world, see a huge amount of variation. It's, after all, what's fundamental for selection to get a grip at all. Um, and so what we find at a level of abstraction that philosophers are naturally drawn to may not turn out to be very interesting biologically in much the same way that, yes, you could say, you know, flight in insects, flight in birds, flight in bats, flight in flying fish. Um, it's all flight, and yeah, they have to have some way of generating lift and propulsion, um, but you know, yawn. That's not very interesting from a scientific point of view, right? We really do want to know how is the trick done. Um, and so, I, so if we end up with anything general at the end of it, we go at it by going at the specifics, it seems to me. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask uh, uh, something about something that came up in Victoria's talk, but maybe anyone can speak to it. So, so the evidence where the the fish are like r t rubbing their injury um, or like rocking around um, is is there is there the thought that 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 that's just helpful for bodily injury and not at all evidence that that they're feeling anything? That seems like evidence that they're like trying to soothe themselves or something. Like when I rub. You know where what's hurt. It's so so that the pain goes down. But but is there? I mean, what 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 other explanation is there of that, of that sort of evidence? Is that is that just behavior that we think might that there's a theory where that might help with with the injury absent any sensation? So there are suggestions that rubbing it's certainly in us, as you said, it it helps. I don't know for the fish, but we, that's what we observed. So we saw it. It was a response, and we we measured it, and and other people have repeated those effects. If you give it pain relief, it stops doing that. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, sorry for my hoarse voice, but my question is uh, about anticipation of pain in fish. Uh, it, I study uh, great apes, and if they anticipate that there's going to be a problem, they often scratch. They have uh, big changes in their corticosteroid uh, response. Uh, and so it's hard for me to deny that they've at least learned something that they're not going to enjoy. And I'm curious about fish. And is there any evidence in fish of anticipation? And to Stuart's falsifiable idea about control of the environment, is that then what leads to uh, an urge to control? So, uh, so there are experiments that have looked at condition place avoidance in fish. And they will learn to avoid a place or the, where they've had noxious uh, stimulation or something bad has happened. Um, in terms of pain for uh, other aspects of, of um, for, the, for the control part and actually having more control and therefore more, uh, uh, less of an impact potentially by the, the um, noxious situation. Um, we haven't done those experiments, but if you look at other things like uh, fear that's induced, for example, in terms of if there is, is a threatening situation, then again, if you give the animal more control over that situation, uh, it, 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 uh, the number of things it can do as a consequence of having that control go up. Okay, can I? Go ahead. So many of us seem to be interested in the question of whether fish have a state that is bad for them in virtue of its phenomenal character, in virtue of what it's like to be in that state. Now, I'm curious what you think the neurological evidence uh, has to do with answering that question. So certainly, if we find in other species uh, you know, brain states, brain structures that are very similar to the brain structures that are uh, required for us to feel pain, and they pattern in the same way, they fire in the same way, that's good evidence that they feel pain as well. But it's not clear to me that the absence of that suggests anything in itself uh, for any, you know, the, answering the question whether they feel this bad state. So it seems that really the question needs to boil down to the functional role of pain. So it seems like everybody's pretty agreed that largely there are states in fish that play roughly the same functional role that they play in humans. If we were going to say, OK, we've got some state that plays the same functional role in fish as it does for humans in regulating behavior in response to damage, what 
what is the argument for thinking humans also have this phenomenal experience that goes on that is accompanying that kind of response to injury? It seems that it would be gratuitous for evolution to just give us that extra experience if it wasn't playing some functional role. So the question is, why do you, th like, do you think there's some behavior that pain gets humans that doesn't get uh, fish? And why is the phenomenal experience, uh, an unpleasant phenomenal experience, required to get us that behavior? Who's that? Uh, really, it's for Colin and, and, and Stuart, but if you have thoughts on it too, Victoria, no, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you said a lot. Um, but I guess I'd just say two things in response to that. One is that I try not to lean too heavily, actually, on the neuroscience. And the reason for that is I do think um, neuroscientists need to be a bit more humble about what it is we know. We don't know that much. We know there's some relationship between brains and experience, for sure. Heads full of sawdust don't feel anything. But beyond that, what we know is pretty limited. So I can't come up with a principled reason based on the neurobiology of the fish um, to deny it experiences. I think we can point to the relative sizes, and I think we can point to the different structures and maybe ask some questions, but I can't come up with a principled reason uh, to deny them experiences based on the neurobiology. To your second point about the, the functional activity, the, the you know, functional behavior, I, I think there you, you are perhaps being a little hasty. So when you hook a fish, it pulls. I'm pretty sure that if I hook you, you're not going to pull. So there are, there are differences there that, that are probably matter and, and probably do speak to um, differences in experience. Don't you think your pulling might be associated with how uh, interested you are in trying to escape? Um, yeah, but sharks who don't have nociceptors, they pull too. You know? So, I mean, yeah, fish have an, an interest in escaping in a, in a functional way, but it doesn't mean that um, they're trying to escape because of the experience of pain. And like I say, if you're in pain, I don't think you would pull. So, so I have... Um this allows me to tie in something else that I wanted to say earlier but didn't have a chance to. So I think there's something really interesting. Those fish I showed that are way above the trend line, they tend to be top predators. Um, and actually, a lot of the sharks are up there as well. I don't think you get to be a top predator without having a fair amount of cognitive wherewithal for reasons that we heard about earlier. But I think it's particularly interesting if you talk about deep sea fishing rather than riverside angling, which is popular pastime in Britain, um, then fish actually don't pull. They actually try to get slack in the line. They try to run under the boat. It's a huge challenge, right, to actually get them to, quote, take the hook in a way that then they can't get off it. So, so I think, again, you should just be really, really careful not to generalize about fish. Um, and then regarding functional role, I think the problem with what, what the question, sort of the pretext behind it is the notion of functional role is so vague that, of course, you can say it's similar. But look, walking plays the same functional role in you as swimming does in fish, as flying does in hummingbirds. But they're not the same thing, right? So, so we need to be much more precise about exactly how these systems play into the specifics of learning, long-term uh, long defensive care, um, and all of the other things that I think we're beginning to kind of put together. But, but it, you can't just sort of hand wave towards function and say, oh, yeah, we know it's functionally similar. So let's have one last question in the back. So it seemed to me that um, a lot of Stuart's argument against the idea of uh, fish having pain also knocks off uh, the allowance of pain in other mammals and even in pre-linguistic children. Although they have a cortex, it's not developed, um, it's not all connected to, this, to the sensory cortex. And um, so why then keep the word pain for what I would think about the imposition or the, the, the mediation of semiotics to pain or the, the actually the, the uh, negotiation, the semiotic mediation of all our thought processes, which are distinctively human, for the better or for worse, because actually we can make pain less by thinking and we can make pain more by thinking, depending on, <laughs> on where your thinking goes into. So why, what do we gain theoretically and ethically by saying only this is pain, only this semiotically mediated pain that humans experience by conceptualizing it, naming it, foreseeing it, thinking about it, mulling about it, etc. 
um, what do we gain theoretically and ethically by saying this is the only domain which we will call pain, as opposed to saying how much we can learn about pain in all sorts of species? Because to me, that seems like we're narrowing down a pretty ubiquitous system that makes sense evolutionarily for all animals. So I'll be really quick. So I think theoretically what, what we gain is um, an appreciation that development is important for perception, which we, we can leave behind if we're not careful. I think ethically what we gain is that we need to have an argument about what we do um, with the animal world based on not what we experience, but based on what um, we think has happened, what, what is actually happening in the animal world. So rather than projecting ourselves into the animal world, we treat it for what it really is. I think, I think those things are important. Uh, I think we have to end the session now. Let's thank our speakers. So the next session will start up at 4 o'clock. We have coffee out in the back. Yes, I'm in the same state as